exports of um, renewable capacity installed in Scotland, and we've got rising export to England. Um, Scottish Government is looks like it will meet or get very close to its target of 100% generation um, from renewables um, compared to use in Scotland. Um, but on the other hand, carbon emissions from uh, electricity generation only now account for 3% of total emissions in Scotland. Um, that doesn't mean that there's not massive challenges ahead for the renewable energy um, system in Scotland. First of all, 40% of energy generated in Scotland, well, 35%, let's say, is um, comes from nuclear power. Um, and in 2030, that is going to be phased out. Um, we are relying on electricity for the decarbonisation of heat and transport as um, vehicles and heating systems are electrified and that's going to need a further doubling of energy, um, re renewable energy generation across Scotland. And actually we have very little capacity left for further generation to be connected to our network because most um, of the electricity grid across Scotland is now constrained, which means the cables in the periphery don't have um, the ability to take further power flows without being upgraded. Um, so there's a significant need to develop flexibility and storage on the network to allow it to be used properly. Um, one, when the CCC reported um, to Scottish Government in 2019, um, most of the actions that they said were needed to achieve our renewable electricity targets um, actually had to be taken by Westminster because um, this area is mainly reserved, so Scottish Government's powers are to an extent limited. Um, but I think it's really important that we don't see this as a pure success story and a job done because there's a significant part of it missing, which I think is because not all renewables are equal in the benefit that they give to Scotland and in the way that they contribute towards a just transition. Um, one target that Scottish Government almost certainly won't meet is the target for one gigawatt of renewable um, energy being generated from community and locally owned sources. At the last check we're at 700 kilowatts and that wasn't rising very fast. Um, and that's despite um, initial targets which were about community ownership being watered down to include um, local ownership as well by farmers and estates for example. So yeah I think there's there's already some quite well-known examples of how renewable energy can be very different for Scotland when we think about our industry and we see we have a booming renewables industry in Scotland at the same time as uh, manufacturing um, facilities like Bifab which should be supplying our industry are at risk of being shut down. I think that also applies um, around ownership of energy systems um, and around how the power flows. So right now, the, the areas in Scotland that produce um, some of the largest surpluses of energy for export to the rest of Scotland and to England are the same areas that suffer the highest levels of fuel poverty. And that's because there's no, there's no ability in our current system to directly use energy locally. Um, uh, electricity is treated essentially as an export commodity, which is sent out to the wider market. Um, and then the same people in these electricity producing regions buy, have to buy their energy back at a much higher price. Um, when we think about the ownership of an energy system, um, renewable energy which is um, built by a developer often includes a community, a community benefit payment and the recommended level of that is £5,000 per megawatt but in most cases except for that community benefit payment to the local community the income from that project will all go straight out of the local area and go to whatever normally international development company has built that renewable energy. On the other hand, community-owned energy um, that 
of the groups that we're working with are receiving between 50 and 100,000 pounds per megawatt in money that they invest directly back into the local area. So, so the benefits of some sorts of renewable energy to Scotland's economy and to the local area are far more than others. And this is especially important when we talk about um, a green recovery from COVID, COVID, when we talk about climate jobs, um, and when we look at rural areas where the tourist industry is going to be really badly hit and renewable energy is being relied upon as one of the alternative ways to bring money into those economies. Um, the sort of renewable energy will depend, will dictate whether that actually has real value or not. Um, so energy, which, um, sorry. So the groups which develop community energy projects are mainly development trusts. And they are essentially local an anchor organizations that aren't just working in electricity generation. Um, community energy is used to provide a stable income source for these organizations that otherwise don't have any stable or long-term funding to support measures that they'll be taking in energy efficiency, in education, in low carbon transport, in community woodlands, um, and around local planning and resilience. A just transition needs to be a democratic transition. And one thing that Scotland lacks more than any other country in Europe is local democracy. The local authority, local councils of, well, the local authority is the smallest level of democracy that's actively functioning in Scotland, and that covers 200,000 people, which is one or two orders of magnitude greater than in many other countries in Europe. And development trusts have essentially um, evolved to try to fill this gap, this local democratic deficit that we have for representation and decision making in Scotland's communities. Um, and yeah, so though I'm talking about energy here, this really applies across the whole spectrum of the transition. Um, and it's been development trusts in many areas that, oh, okay, I'm gonna try and speed up because I'm almost at the end of it, but development trusts have been the organizations that have led the response to COVID in local areas and that have been able to take emergency action and ensure that communities are resilient. So in terms of what Scottish government needs to be doing now to ensure a just and green transition, the first thing I would say is reform the community benefit system. Community benefits and shared ownership offers shouldn't be an optional um, add-on for developers, they should be mandatory. And um, the form that community benefits take should, must involve the money being delivered by the local communities, rather than what's often the case now, which is um, the development companies themselves deciding how to spend that money. Um, Scottish government needs to invest in, well, it needs to support local energy measures. So there's a local ele electricity bill in Westminster today that would um, set provisions for local sale of energy. And so that needs to have full support. And um, there's also significant opportunities to leverage procurement processes. So how local authorities and how Scottish government buys things for the energy system um, that could involve what Devon Council down south is trialling at the moment, which is creation of a community CFD by procuring community energy um, in preference to um, other forms of energy and using that to support the multiplier effect of local projects and on the local economy. Finally, and most importantly, Scottish Government needs to invest in building community capacity. Um, supporting development trusts and supporting community energy groups. The, the CARES funding that Scottish Government does provide for community energy is great, but it doesn't support early level development of um, groups and capacity building, so that the cover of groups across Scotland is incredibly patchy. It doesn't provide the long-term stability that 
a local anchor organization needs to take real long-term action in a community and it doesn't sufficiently cover regional support networks and integration with local authorities. I'm already over time, so I'll leave it there. Really, very, there's lots of really interesting points there and it's great to have that local perspective. Um, we've, we're back on track with our technology, so we're gonna stick with the original uh, order, which is Laurie, Laurie Vandenberg from Oil Change International, who uh, campaign and research uh, what the oil industry is doing uh, around the world and in Britain. Laurie, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Good. Thanks, Matthew. Um, okay, I'm going to share my screen so that you all can see the slides that I've prepared. Um, so, hi everyone, my name is Laurie and I work with Oil Change International. I started working with them in January this year. And I, can you all see my screen? Yep, I can. Okay, I'm going to be speaking to the findings of a report that was um, published by uh, Friends of the Earth Scotland, Platform and Oil Change International in May last year. Um, I didn't write this report, it was written by Craig Mottet and uh, Matthew, I believe that you have contributed to, uh, to, just, to just this a little report bit. as well. Only a little uh, bit. Okay, and Anna from Platform um, was also one of the writers of this report. Um, and I don't have the illusion that in this presentation I will do it justice, but I'm going to do my best. Um, I'm based in Amsterdam myself, um, so I'm, I'm not following uh, Scottish pol politics very closely, um, but I did a study in Scotland, in Edinburgh, um, in 2013, and I, I really loved uh, living there, so really happy to be among Scottish folks today. <laughs> Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, North Sea oil and gas production. I'm going to show some figures that show that the emissions from already developed fossil fuels reserves across the world are not uh, compatible with climate goals. I'm going to talk about the maximizing economic recovery policy um, in the UK that is not compatible with climate goals. And I'm going to, speaking about the, um, to be speaking about the impacts of COVID-19 on oil and gas production um, and about um, uh, the options for a managed uh, and equitable uh, decline of oil and gas production versus um, a uh, scenario in which uh, the phase out of uh, oil and gas production is unmanaged and inequitable. Um, I'm going to say why another world is within reach and I'll end sharing some of the uh, main recommendations from the report that was released last year and hopefully I'll manage to go through all of this within eight minutes. So let's go. Um, so first I want to share with you this graph that shows that um, the emissions from uh, those fossil fuel reserves that are already in production. So that's the left bar in the left graph. Um, and these, um, uh, this bar excludes the reserves from uh, fields that are not yet in production, but that companies and governments are planning to produce. Um, these emissions uh, already far exceed the 1.5 uh, carbon budget. And that means that we currently worldwide don't have the space to further expand fossil fuel production. And if we want to stay below 1.5 degrees, instead, we need a very rapid phase out of oil and gas production and uh, use. Um, the right uh, graph shows a, paints a similar picture. This is from the UNEP emission gap report that was published in November last year. And it shows that uh, countries worldwide are planning to produce about 120% more oil, uh, gas and coal than compatible with a 1.5 degree trajectory. Um, but instead of planning to phase out oil and gas production in the UK, the UK has an official policy that focus on, focuses on maximizing economic recovery from um, uh, the North Sea. And uh, this policy uh, puts a le legal obligation on um, relevant stakeholders to take all steps necessary to ensure that the maximum value of economic recoverable petroleum is recovered from the strata between um, beneath relevant UK waters. Um, the question um, that one might ask um, about this commitment is um, uh, one about definitions. So economic to whom? 
Um, the UK currently has a tax regime and a subsidies regime that is uh, very uh, favorable to oil and gas producers and not so favorable to uh, UK taxpayers. And as you can see in these graphs, um, the UK um, has a very um, low government revenue per barrel compared to other North Sea oil and gas producers. Um, this also means that um, the, the tax benefits and, and subsidies that exist for North Sea oil and gas producers mean that some of the um, uh, progress that has been made with reducing emissions through phasing out coal-fired electricity um, are going to be negated um, through uh, the additional production um, of oil and gas that is planned um, uh, to be supported through uh, these existing subsidy schemes. Um, so um, the graph, this graph from our report shows that recent subsidies uh, introduced for oil and gas extraction will add twice as much carbon to the atmosphere as the phase out of coal power uh, saves in the UK. Um, and I'm going to, to skip this picture because there's a bit more to get through. So as I already mentioned, the UK is planning to maximize economic recovery from the North Sea. That means that um, carbon emissions from UK oil and gas will uh, not go down as, as needed to uh, stay below 1.5 degrees. And if we um, look at a picture that shows what the impacts would be if all countries would follow uh, the UK's approach, this shows that we would end up with even more emissions than today compared uh, in 2015. Um, so this picture shows that if other countries will, were to follow this approach of phasing out uh, coal fire power whilst maximizing oil and gas production, we would end up with uh, higher emissions um, in 2015 instead of uh, net zero emissions or preferably zero emissions. So um, the coronavirus has of course uh, caused oil prices to drop recently and we've seen the responses of the industry uh, to the situation in, in the news over the past few weeks. So um, a researcher from the University of Aberdeen um, uh, has shown that uh, under today's energy prices or oil prices, a third of North Sea oil and gas is likely to be left in the ground. And um, the UK oil and gas industry branches have also warned that about 30,000 jobs are to be lost um, because of the impact of COVID-19 um, on North Sea oil and gas production. Um, that said, already prior to the current crisis, uh, oil and gas industries across the world were struggling to um, deal with the increased competition from renewables um, and also with increased opposition from environmental movements and legal challenges, etc. Um, and um, over the past decade, uh, the oil and gas sector has been the worst performing sector across all sectors in the stock markets. And um, we've seen uh, jobs being lost in the sec sector for the past decades already. Um, so that raises the question, um, what is a long-term long solution to this um, permanent decline of, of the industry and also the need to, to rapidly phase down oil and gas production if we want to meet climate goals? And um, ooh, I see that I need to admit someone to the meeting room. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so, um, well, the industry has responded by calling for public support and also some of the members of Scottish uh, Parliament have uh, supported these calls. Um, and as I mentioned, the industry was already showing a signs of um, a permanent decline. So uh, it's really the question whether that um, provides a long term solution to the situation that we're in. Um, this is a, a picture that kind of paints the, the different scenarios that, the, um, that, um, that we could see for um, fossil fuel production in the UK. And, and this basically also applies to other uh, producing countries. So governments have a choice between different scenarios, um, one in which they continue to expand fossil fuel extraction and then at a later stage, uh, limit extraction um, to meet uh, climate goals and that would lead to economic chaos because that would involve massive 
stranded assets and also massive sudden job losses, or they could um, not limit emi the emissions from uh, fossil fuel production and that would lead to climate chaos and that would also have all sorts of detrimental effects, of course. Um, and another scenario would be one in which uh, governments take early action to manage the decline of the oil and gas industry in a way that supports workers and, and communities uh, through the transition. And, and to us, obviously, that's a favorable um, trajectory. Um, so Greg Mattit, who wrote the, the Sea Change paper, also uh, published a report together with Sipan Karta from the Stockholm Environment Institute uh, last week that looks into the question of which countries should phase out production first if, you, um, if, if we need to have an equitable uh, phase out of oil and gas production worldwide. And um, the, these graphs show that uh, the countries that have uh, have a higher capacity to uh, manage the transition and that have a lower dependence on um, oil and gas for their revenues have an easier transition and therefore should take the first steps to manage that transition. And those countries that are very reliant on oil and gas for government re revenues for up to 80 or 90 percent of their government government revenues um, even, uh, they of course face a more challenging transition and uh, often those countries also have fewer uh, resources to uh, support uh, workers and communities through the transition, so they should also receive, um, get international support for that transition. So this analysis shows that the UK alongside Canada and the US um, and, and as well as Norway should be um, leading uh, the international phase out of fossil fuel production and should also support those countries that face tougher transition challenges through the transition. Um, so very briefly, um, the report also goes into um, the, um, uh, the opportunities for phasing out oil and gas production and for um, creating new jobs through uh, investments in renewables. Um, it shows that um, it compiles some of the evidence from research that shows that the UK could be entirely powered by clean energy by 2050 or earlier. And it also um, uh, used uh, modeling to um, paint a picture of uh, the um, uh, clean job opportunities uh, that can be created through investments in energy efficiency and renewables. And um, that modeling shows that for every oil and gas job affected by a managed phase out of extraction, more than three new jobs could be created in renewable energy or energy efficiency. And can, um, you, can you start winding up now, please? Sorry. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Um, uh, and that is, of course, not to say that phasing out oil and gas extraction will not be challenging and uh, that it won't require massive support for uh, workers that are affected by a phase out of oil and gas extraction. But it is to say that a, a, a transition is possible and, and should be supported by government and uh, um, can, then, can then be with, within reach. Um, so I'll wind up with the, um, with the key recommendations for the report. So the re uh, from the report, so the report advises the UK and Scottish government to stop issuing licenses and permits for new oil and gas exploration and development to phase out subsidies for oil and gas extraction um, to uh, enable rapid building of the clean energy industry and to open formal consultations with trade unions to develop and implement a just transition strategy for oil dependent regions and communities. And there are some near term opportunities to influence this debate uh, in the UK and in Scotland. So the Oil and Gas Authority has a consultation that um, looks into this question of how the maximizing economic recovery policy could be aligned with the UK's net zero target. And um, the Just Transition Commission, and I'm sure that we'll talk more about this on the webinar today, also has a consultation um, that uh, will be used to inform its final recommendations. And I have a few resources here, and that's, that's the end of my presentation. Sorry for going over time. Well, I mean, thank you very, very much for that. It's incredibly informative um, 
uh, information about about an industry which is not subject to enough scrutiny. I remember my jaw dropping when I read all this information. I'm going to save in the chat, there is a link to that report, but let's move on quickly. Thanks, Lowry, to Almuth. Almuth from Biofuel Watch. Um, Almuth, I'm sure you'll be able to explain what the mission of Biofuel Watch is better than me, so I'll just hang, go, hand over to you straight away. Yes, thank you. Let me just sort out the screen share. Can you see it? Yep. Okay, good. Um, okay, well, five. No, one sec, sorry. Okay, I think you can see it. Okay, so I'm Almot. I work with a group called Biofuel Watch. Uh, we started in 2006, uh, really at the time very concerned about the EU, then what were then still proposals for EU biofuel targets and uh, uh, you know the impacts those uh, those would have and have since had uh, on forests and climate and communities worldwide. And really, since 2010 onwards, we've become really, really alarmed to see the scale or the growing scale of wood burning across the UK and increasingly in other countries. So, uh, quick, uh, quick introduction. So, um, I've been looking really at the role of bioenergy. Um, and with that, I'm really looking at wood burning or solid biomass for energy, especially electricity, and uh, keeping in mind that the vast majority, almost all of that is wood. Uh, now, um, firstly, uh, looking at um, the pictures from, uh, from the between, com comparison between uh, England and Scotland, um, as far as the renewable electricity sector is concerned, you know, Scotland gets far more of its electricity from wind and far less um, from biomass. Biomass being a wood burning, uh, the, the dark, uh, green, dark blue uh, part. Uh, so, and that is a really good thing. You know, we still have, you know, there's still, you know, one, um, yeah, there's still a substantial share, but it's nowhere near the more than a quarter that it is in uh, in England. Uh, and that is a really good thing. And it's a good thing for forest climate and communities. Looking at the UK, uh, we've got, you know, the, the lion's share of England's um, and the UK's uh, biomass um, contribution comes from drugs power station. In terms of the smokestack emissions, there's a single biggest carbon dioxide emitter. And uh, they receive 2.1 million pounds in subsidies every single day. That is subsidies that could and should otherwise be going to uh, to energies like wind and solar power. So um, why is that bad for the climate? Well, in um, back in uh, 2018, about 800 scientists signed, uh, signed a letter, uh, and I can put the link in the chat box after my presentation, warning that when we cut down trees and we burn them for energy, regardless of how sustainable your forest management is, regardless of whether you're clear cutting biodiverse forests or you're managing tree plantations, um, you will increase the amount of carbon in the atmosphere and warming for decades or centuries and basically move us further away from the goal of keeping warming to within 1.5 or even 2 degrees. Uh, and that's since been echoed by uh, the European um, Academies of Science Advisory Council and, and, you know, and, and several other voices. So, um, uh, how to go down? Hang on. Ah, excuse me. What's going on? Sorry, I'm trying to. Ah, yeah, here we go. Um, and so basically, yes, it applies to. Um, no, was this picture first? So in England, you know, what we are seeing is the destruction of. Um, no, sorry. So basically, what we've heard before. So basically, the climate impact don't just apply to the clear cutting of forests, they also apply to wood from uh, Scottish tree plantations, burned for example here in Stevens Cross Power Station and, and various um, small medium-sized plants dotted across, uh, dotted across the country. Um, in England, so this is impact on forests, uh, drugs burns more wood than the UK produces annually and most of that comes from uh, the southeastern USA and that includes um, some, um, 
some uh, wood from in incredibly biodiverse um, bottomland hardwood forests are being called, uh, being clear cut uh, increasingly to make pellets that are shipped across the Atlantic. Um, now, however, it isn't just about where a company sources the wood from. We have to put this in the context of uh, the UK's annual wood cons consumption being almost five times, about oh, more than five times as large than our annual wood production. So therefore, even if Scotland, as is the case at the moment, uh, uses bio wood for bioenergy uh, for domestically, that still means that this wood isn't going to other users and that our imports of, of wood from uh, countries like the USA, Canada, the Baltic states is increasing, or Brazil for that matter, is increasing as a result. And in the case of waste wood that is predominantly burned in a Mackinch biomass power station, uh, that raises quite similar issues because waste wood is normally in very high demand uh, from other industries. So you have a displacement of where it's very likely that other industries will be importing virtual wood from abroad. So complicated. Very quickly, biomass burning coal also is bad for public health. It causes comparable levels of air pollution and the impact as coal burning. Um, I wanted to mention bioenergy with carbon back capture and storage or BECs uh, because that has been, you know, it's very much being talked about in relation to Scottish, uh, class, future Scottish climate plans and, and, uh, and, and uh, climate policy. Uh, and uh, unfortunately endorsed by the Committee on Climate Change, uh, which we find, you know, very regrettable. Very quickly, nobody in the world has ever proven any technology involving the captured storage of CO2 from a power station or power or heat or power plant burning biomass. The very, very minute small, uh, product testing of a novel solvent going on uh, at drugs power station, but this is not a uh, Bex project is such, it really is just simple product testing. And they've never, kept, they've never stored uh, even one gram of carbon dioxide. Uh, but if it was to work, if Bex was ever going to work, you'd basically be looking at needing to burn more trees uh, for the same amount or less energy because of the energy penalty that comes from capturing and compressing CO2. So instead of drugs burning, uh, something as 7.6 million tons of, of pellets uh, per year, uh, they would be burning something like 10 plus million tons of pellets per year for the same output. And they are only about 38% efficient already at this stage without bags. Um, and what we do know for, you know, what has been really, really shown is that the best, single best way of capturing carbon in the time scale we have to try and prevent more than 1.5 degrees or even two degrees of warming, is to protect uh, mature forests and allowing mature biodiverse forests to expand. There's a paper you can look up called Proforestation from the USA, uh, you know, by somebody called Professor Mumo. Um, and uh, basically the idea that we can use you know, huge amounts of wood for energy runs directly counter to the need to um, uh, to protect and to allow those, you know, mature standing forests to to recover. Um, what does it mean for policy in Scotland? So, first of all, Scotland, although I mean subsidy policies are largely UK, but nonetheless, Scotland, Scottish government, and Scottish policymakers should support redirecting existing subsidies for biomass power to wind, solar, and waste hydro power. This would really save emissions. We'd like to see the Scottish National Investment Bank not supporting developments which will increase wood burning for energy. I would like to stress that BECS must have no role to play in Scottish climate policy and targets. If it was included, it would simply result in targets being missed. And that's me. Uh, stop share. Fantastic, Almuth. Um, very co co concise and to the, with that, to the point. It adds to these what we're taking from these three great contributions about things which need to be done now in Scotland. Um, 